Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by The Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. Shield of the Republic is dedicated to the proposition first articulated by Walter Lippmann in World War II that a strong foreign policy is the shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman. I'm a Bulwark contributor, a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, as well as a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center. I'm joined, as I always am, by Elliot Cohen, my partner in strategery. Elliot, over to you to introduce today's guest. Well, thank you very much, Eric. It's always uh, good to be here with you. So our uh, guest today is a uh, colleague of mine at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I hang my hat at least part of the time. Jude Blanchett is the Freeman Chair in China Studies, and he uh, he has a very interesting biography. I'm going to allow him to tell his own story. And I think it's a particularly interesting biography because a lot of China experts come at it out of academe, and that's not where you came to this from. So, Jude, do you want to uh, give us your biography, if you would? Uh, certainly, and, and but let me first say, uh, really a pleasure to be here. I'm, I've been a listener from the the very beginning, so I appreciate the the invitation and, and the chance to join the conversation. I'm glad you think my biography is interesting. My my wife doesn't, nor do I. So this will uh, uh, this is a rare opportunity. Um, yeah, that that that's true. I um, sort of have a bottom up approach to how I've came into the world of of studying China's political system. Um, and it was self-taught, which may be evident to many who read my writings, but was a process wherein about 20 years ago, I, on a whim, went to China as an undergraduate student just months before it joined the WTO. And my framing then was of this country moving away from an autocratic system of governance, integrating with the international order. Uh, so I was very much swept up in that same sort of framework which drove U.S. policy at the time. But more importantly, for for just quickly for this story, I, I also knew right away that China was a a place that uh, was going to fascinate me for a very long time, and I wanted to make understanding it uh, my profession. So after that uh, short stint as a student, I ended up moving back and staying for the better part of a decade. And uh, as you alluded to, non traditionally for think tank China experts, I was working in the private sector the entirety of that time and advising companies uh, and firms on political risk. And just as a final note here, throughout the early 2010s, I had a what at the time was a sort of eccentric interest in the workings of the Communist Party. And so I would always try to shoehorn into my analysis about regulatory dynamics, you know, you should really be looking at the Communist Party and understanding how it operates. By the time we moved in 2018, those conversations got dramatically easier because in the space of that sort of six or seven years after Xi Jinping came to power, everyone understood how critically important the Communist Party was to almost all dynamics of civil economic life within China. Um, so that's how I um, that's how I got to CSIS was uh, through some of the um, uh, you know cutting my teeth in country and and that ten years there really frames almost the entirety of how I think and and um, look at China you know reading open source or reading Xi Jinping speeches is great but for me those are then filtered through that tactile sense you get from you know time on the ground. So let me um, ask you to develop that a little bit more. What do you think are some of the insights that come more easily to you than perhaps they might to other more academic kinds of experts, both as a result of that prolonged period on the ground, as you say, looking at it from the bottom up, but but also having had that business perspective initially? What what sorts of things are you more inclined to pay attention to or to see, do you think, than um, some of your peers? Well, and in fairness, I should say, I, I think a lot of the peers in the China world have deep in-country experience. So in that sense, I'm not, I'm not unique. Probably the business experience I have relative to the average think tanker m might be more of an, an asymmetrical uh, component of my analysis. But I would say two things. Uh, first is, I've always seen politics in China as much through the lens of economics, wealth creation, as I have through a, a pure power analysis. And I think indeed that tracks quite nicely with how the Communist Party thinks about the economy and wealth creation is this is not a distinct field from 
uh, national power. These are these are in, interlinked, and in that sense, they're very good students of of Paul Kennedy. There, the second is, um, and I think this is notable now that over the past several years, where we've just had a, a significant wave of of sort of new analysts coming into China or individuals looking at other fields who are now coming over to China. I think when you read a speech, when you read a document, when you read, you know, maybe we'll talk about this later, the joint announcement between, you know, China and, and Russia, for me, that immediately needs to get filtered through an understanding of the workaday world of the Chinese bureaucracy. When Xi Jinping makes an announcement, a declaratory announcement about what he wants China to do, that's really the beginning of a complex process of bargaining, of using tools to persuade, using punishment, trying to corral an incredibly large, complex political bureaucratic system. And so intentions are incredibly important. Goals are important, especially for a teleocratic Leninist system like China's. But unless you can map that onto a key question, which is how does a party secretary out in Podunk, China, interpret, misinterpret, malinterpret, drag their feet, then you really can't understand, uh, you know, sort of praxis. You're really only at the theoretical level. And so final thought is I think that has helped me to right size some of the uh, pronouncements that come from China. And I think I've got sort of a good uh, tactile sense for, you know, which of these are pure aspirations and which of these may, may see some traction. So let me ask you one more question and then uh, uh, pass things off to to Eric. Uh, you've started a uh, what I think is a terrific uh, new program at CSIS on uh, open source translation. This is the kind of thing the federal government used to do quite intensively during the Cold War. I remember, uh, as I'm sure Eric, you do as well, r- routinely reading vast quantities of things put out by FIBIS, the uh, Foreign Broadcasting Information Service, and the uh, uh, Joint Publications Research Service (JPRS). These were these were really valuable, extensive translations. And you've launched something similar in the China field. I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about that, and what are some of the preliminary insights that you think you're gleaning from that? Yeah, and, and Phibis was a was the direct inspiration here. Uh, a previous guest on your podcast, Seth Jones, who's also a colleague of of ours, he and I cooked up this project two years ago after Seth in. Uh, doing the research for for his book Three Dangerous Men, you know, as a non Chinese speaker, uh, said, "Hey, where, Jude, where do I get all the translations of military writings and doctrine?" And I said, "You don't. Um, they're, they're not out there in the in, in the public domain." And so that started off a conversation. The real motivating idea here is we have lost our two muscles. One is the kind of Cold War era Phibis muscle, and the second is our our Pekingologist muscle. Um, our Sovietologist muscle. I think after the collapse of the Soviet Union and through the heady days of the 1990s and then the global war on terror, and this tracks the larger shift away from the skills needed for great power competition, we we just stopped looking at and trying to analyze China's political system from the outside. And I think we're racing to catch up now at, at this critical time. So the project is a modest attempt to help drive more nuanced, objective discussions of China's intentions, capabilities, ambitions, by really engaging with the vast quantity of strategic writings in, in Chinese, which are essentially, from Beijing's perspective, encrypted because they're, they're in a foreign language. Um, so what we're trying to do here is listen in a little bit to the conversations as they uh, are occurring in, in, in China and try to understand, for example, what is the organic domestic conversation around China's relationship with Russia? What are the fault lines and what are the opportunities for these countries as Chinese academics see it, not as we from the outside uh, impose upon it. So this is just, again, a small effort. I think hopefully, and we're seeing now the gears start to turn in the federal government. So I think this is a temporary drought. And in the next several years, we're going to see a real flood of translations coming here. Final thought, though, is translations are great, but really then that needs to be matched with deep, deep analysis and skill set to interpret a Xi Jinping speech, because as we knew, even in the Soviet Union, seeing a speech is one thing, interpreting the signals that it is sending is an entirely different skill set. 
I'm really actually quite excited to hear you talk about this open source project with Elliot. Um, as he said, I was a, also in my government career, a huge consumer of FBIS. I used to have mounds and mounds of orange books on the Soviet Union and blue books on, on translations from the Middle East. So, hey, good luck with that. And I'm going to be anxiously looking forward to the, to the product. You know, you made extremely good use of open sources a couple of years ago for the book you wrote, China's New Red Guards about the rise of kind of neo-Maoism. And this was not just, you know, sort of revolutionary kitsch, people liking the, you know, Mao cap and Mao tunic as a fashion statement. This was really a kind of uh, return to the chairman's thinking about China's role in the world, how it ought to behave, uh, how it ought to behave at home in terms of dealing with the rising inequality that the reforms had, had kicked off. Can you talk a little bit about where we are with neo Maoism? You know, uh, several years on from the book under under Xi. Now that Xi has established Xi Jinping thought as you know a category of its own, as uh, like Mao thought, what should we understand from this, and how do you think it's going to affect China's approach to the world? I think the most salient point to make is throughout the reform and opening period many of us outside of the country assumed that there was essentially only one thread of, of political culture in China. And that was this movement now out of the planned economy um, towards global integration, if not democracy, at least sort of a, a small L liberalization and small P pluralization of political culture. And what I got interested in is Xi Jinping didn't come out of nowhere. And the ideas animating his very vocal uh, a nationalist agenda of party dominance, uh, of, of a very strong and robust state sector, large SOEs. And, and increasingly, you've seen this culture of real kind of communist conservatism, um, this real traditionalism of, of thought and a very almost puritanical view of, of culture, right? You've seen that manifest with crackdown on foreign brands and foreign movies um, this real celebration of this kind of earthy, distorted, but earthy um, view of Confucianism and even the party's own history. So I became interested in where this this emerged from. And without boring everyone or reciting a you know a, the, the thesis of the book, what I found was is, yes, there was a thread of many in China wanted to integrate, open up, but you had a counter narrative there as well. Um, you had a pushback which was not only elements of the, the Communist Party establishment who saw reform and opening as a, a threat to power, but increasingly younger Chinese who wanted, who, who that idea of China as a, as, a, as a strong superpower really resonated with them. And the idea that China was gonna play a more muscular role on the global stage resonated with them. And importantly for the, the sort of neo-Maoist element, a very different view about economic systems and almost no real firm belief in a sort of a neoliberal capitalist order. Many of these were individuals who, who really came to the fore during the debates over WTO accession in the late 1990s. And they saw the WTO as essentially a tool for the West, a Trojan horse, so to speak, to crack open China, to send in a horde of foreign capitalists to exploit the country. Um, and so the movement ar arose out of that and got a rocket booster with this new fang dangled technology called the internet. So it's an interesting story because it really goes against much of our, uh, the dominant narrative in the US after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a sort of a teleological upward and onward, you know, Coca-Cola and blue jeans will, will defeat, you know, all the old ideologies of the 20th century. And I think what we saw is there's a really enduring thread of Chinese political culture that is, in the Chinese context, conservative, which would actually mean le almost kind of leftist in our language, but is very much rooted in deeply nationalist orientation, some skepticism and, and, and indeed deep hostility about the outside world, sees hostile forces and, and subversion by Western powers everywhere draws on a deep historical narrative of China as a country oppressed by imperialism and now is a now is a return to you know past glory and so this is um, this is deeply rooted uh, I think this 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 kind of contests with other more pluralistic notions and unfortunately when you have a top leadership 
like you do with Xi Jinping, who, as far as I can tell now, is going to remain in power until he's 633. There's very little structural mechanisms for a, 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 a rebalancing of that political culture. It's really now setting in with Xi Jinping. And I think that is going to have some pretty profound knock-on effects for how China's foreign policy evolves, how China engages in the world. And finally, there's a big question of when does China reopen? Um, when does China open after COVID-19? When does China kind of, quote unquote, return to normal? And I think a, a, a worrying thought for many of us is it, it may not because you've had this this kind of more conservative strain of the party now smash into contingent events like COVID-19, great power competition with the U.S. have kind of all come together to reinforce some of the worst elements of China's political culture. As, as you were speaking just now, I was thinking to myself that uh, <laughs> Tom Friedman and uh, Frank Fukuyama, each in their different ways, have, uh, have something to answer for. <laughs> No, because it, we didn't really anticipate that there would be not just a, these sort of refractory powers that would be difficult to deal with, but which would really ideologically not accept many of the premises of the world order that we thought was being created in the 1990s. If I could just ask one question along the lines of what you said. So you, one of the pieces which I just read was this translation about sort of how the Communist Party in this town I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, uh, Nyang Zigwan, right. how they view the world. And, and you, you should describe it. But the thing that struck me about it, th there's just many levels of paranoia here. I mean, it is a, it's not just ideologically hostile to the West, it's enemies at every turn. And I, mm -hmm. what are the implications of that kind of worldview? It seems to me it, it could, that could get quite ugly. Yeah, just the, the document that Elliot, for, for listeners, the document Elliot is talking about, we translated a almost what you would consider a, 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 a pick a random town in America. This is just a small town outside of Beijing. And we translated one of their, um, the town's sort of security posture review, you could almost call it. Um, these happen all over. This is This is totally normal. But when I was reading the document, this is a, a rural town, very small population, um, and yet you look at the, how they're describing their security environment. It's um, we've we've done well, comrades, in protecting against foreign subversion, um, uh, threats from Christian missionaries, uh, foreign terrorists, ideological subversion, and I found that quite striking because, in the same way, you know. Um, we talk about the paranoid style of American politics. There's now this very unfortunate deep institutionalization of this national security first view. This has been there, I should say, going back to the 1950s, Mao really became worried about foreign plots. And I should say, with some good reason, efforts to sort of take down the Communist Party. But but this has really been deeply implanted in the, the party's ideological worldview and, and reform and opening kind of pushed it back, constrained it, contained it. But now Xi Jinping has really unleashed this. And it's not just a it's not just an ideology, as I was mentioning. It is now written into strategic documents. It is now in the sort of key performance indicators for low level cadres out in, you know, the equivalent of uh, Kansas, um, who are now going around and, and looking out for foreign subversion. Um, and again, these sorts of cycles of tightening and opening are quite common in China, but it almost feels like now the the metric on the, you know, the the pendulum, which would allow you to swing back once you've gone too far. Unfortunately, with Xi Jinping now staying in power forever, ha has has been broken. Um, so this again just reinforces the the idea I was just saying of I, I'm worried about when does China course correct. It feels now quite bleak. I want to get to something you adverted to earlier, which is the Xi Putin joint statement and how how you read that. But but before we go there, can you tell me how much should we see Xi as a product of this neo Maoist ideology that you've described, and how much should we see him as a beneficiary of it, as someone who's using it in order to solidify his own hold on power and that of those who are part of his faction? It also strikes me that this paranoia, and I'd be interested in your comment on that, is 
a function of how one gets ahead in the Communist Party. I mean, you know, you've got factions, you've got people uh, looking out for other people who are trying to waylay them as they make their way up the party hierarchy. And it seems to me some of this uh, paranoia is is just deeply rooted in, in the way the party operates and how uh, leadership evolves inside the party. Yeah, those, those are two really great questions. Um, on the first question about Xi, Xi Jinping is a very unradical leader. And the core elements, a lot of the, of the neo-Maoist economic worldview do not comport with Xi's very state capitalist view of how China's economic system should be structured. So I think if you were to get some of the real bomb throwing neo Maoists in a room with Xi Jinping, there, there may not actually be much fundamental overlap in terms of policy. What I think Xi Jinping has done very effectively, though, is he has jujitsued the neo Maoists to serve a very important role for him. And they now occupy a space as almost an online cultural brown shirts where they are sort of ideological stormtroopers who spend time waging wars against what they call historical nihilism, which is simply um, non-official views of history. So anything which veers from party orthodoxy, they're out attacking and savaging liberal intellectuals. And again, I, I should say for listeners in the Chinese political context, liberal would mean more constitutionalist free market what we may call more right-leaning here, whereas oftentimes conservative means far left. I, it's, 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 um, it's flipped, but, the more, but when I say liberal, I mean sort of more pro-Western pro leading constitutionalist free market scholars have been absolutely savaged and hounded out of the uh, cyber ecosystem. And that may sound, um, th the fact that this is online may not sound too consequential, but of course, as we see here with Twitter, um, and social media dominant platform for social and civic discourse is increasingly moving from offline to on. So the dynamics of cyber discourse are incredibly important. And Xi Jinping has essentially said to them, I no longer want to see you in the streets, um, but the online discourse is yours. So have at it because they reinforce this ideological orthodoxy, which Xi Jinping aspires to enforce upon the whole country. I, I just final comment on the Xi thing. Um, he really has no tolerance for heterodoxy. Um, this is not a, as Dung said, a period of crossing the river by feeling the stones. He's not looking to crowdsource, even from his own policy experts, unique ideas. He's very certain on where he wants the country to go. And pluralism is a, is a hurdle um, that comes at a time of great consequence. So we frankly can't afford this. Uh, on the second thing, just quickly on career incentives and the way that this new political correctness integrates into functional administration of the state, I think this is a real concern. Um, in the Mao period, especially in the Cultural Revolution, there was a debate between should you be red or expert, or expert right? A trade-off between political loyalty and technocratic competency. And during the, the extremes of the Cultural Revolution, guess which one won? It was political loyalty which moved you up. And that has a real functional effect on how policies are formulated and implemented. We're not at the Cultural Revolution, and we should be very clear at how much daylight is between then and now. But I will say, at the margin, the more we move towards uh, a personalized dictatorship under Xi Jinping, which I think we are, the more the incentive uh, will be for cadres to be uh, moving along with Xi Jinping, following in his wake, doing what they can to bootlick, you know, sycophancy may become the coin of the realm. And that really will be a departure from nearly four decades of a increasingly empowered technocratic elite who'd studied in Western universities, you know, knew all the latest tricks of the trade that they could bring to bear to economic policy. We're not going to fundamentally move away from that, but even marginal shifts for a country of China's size and consequence are meaningful to the United States. I mean, in one way, this, that's clearly dangerous. We've seen in Russia what happens when you have a uh, autocratic personality who has been in power for a long time, who thinks he really knows, uh, who's getting older, and who, who for whom ideology in some sense matters a lot. But at another level, and, and here we'll tap some of that economic expertise, 
It seems to me the implications of that are China gets less efficient, is less likely to grow. They're more likely to make bad decisions, including bad decisions, among, among other things, about opening up after uh, COVID. I mean, it, you know, to an outsider, it looks as though, on the one hand, their zero tolerance policy towards COVID, you know, worked uh, at considerable cost. But, you know, Mr. Omicron doesn't care about Xi Jinping thought. And, you know, they can't contain it and they'll pay a price for it. So can you ruminate on on those themes for a bit? Yeah. Um, you know, in reverse order, I, I think you're right. And this is where the, you know, I've, as I've said before, you know, Xi Jinping has a plan. But, uh, you know, the Mike Tyson adage, you've got a plan until you get punched in the face by reality. And I should say Xi Jinping has taken some licks right now. Um, and Xi Jinping thought is a piece of paper that is having, I think, deep difficulty navigating exigency and and the sort of they're sailing very close to the shoals of reality, um, including a, a dramatically deteriorating security environment in their own backyard. What I worry about, though, is you could foresee a possibility where things get very bad in China and that forces elements of the system to say, all right, enough. We've gone through 10 plus years of wolf warriorism. We've seen China's reputation decline globally as, as proven by poll after poll after poll. We've seen the relationship with the United States as well as the relationship with the UK, Australia, Japan, you name it, India, um, really start to go down the tank. But what I think honestly more likely to happen is, and now I'm, I don't want to be extreme here, but I think you now imagine China more along the North Korea route. It's not a course correction you get. It is a, a consolidation and a, and a hunkering down. Um, you have a, a system in power which basically finds way to batten down the hatches and survive. I don't think that's next year. But then again, I don't know how long Xi Jinping is going to stay in power. And this is an individual who has been underestimated by many of us for a very long time. But the key thing to know about him is this is all he's ever known. He is a product of the system. He grew up in the red court in Beijing. He knows factional politics. He knows power struggles. And you could almost look at his 10 years in power and see someone who is coup-proofed by co-opting uh, the security system, the military, um, you know, what we would call sort of the Praetorian Guard, uh, regional commanders, provincial officials. Um, I don't think he did this precisely to, to coup-proof, but he understands that uh, if I want to get anything done, I need my people in the room. So uh, I think this is really the this is the longer term challenge of the many that we have for glimpsing China's future. Right now, it seems like we're we've got two trajectories of you know China onward to galactic domination, or people who say it's going to collapse you know tomorrow. And I think there's a third possibility of this kind of slow atrophy. Um, as the secret sauce of China that's powered its rise over four decades, Xi Jinping begins to spike that with vinegar. And I don't quite know what that looks like, but you see some of the initial signs of that. Your mention of China uh, and Galactic Empire uh, reminds me that you know, I know you're a Star Wars fan. So <laughs> before we leave this podcast, I really want to hear what you think this sort of wave of quite interesting Chinese science fiction that's come out over the last several years tells us about uh, China's future trajectory. But l let's turn now to the uh, sort of uh, axis of authoritarianism that seems to have been born uh, in Beijing with the putin Xi joint statement. How do you read that, and how should uh, our colleagues in government be looking at this now, and and how should they think about it? Yeah, this is um, to to the idea of reality. You know, punching someone in the face. I think this is one where we we might have have gotten a little bit of a wake up um, a wake up call here. Um, you know, obviously we had been hoping this was going to be a one front great power competition, and now we're seeing something uh, emerge that's quite different. I, I think I'm. Um, I'm probably in the middle of of two, you know, of two views. One is which I think is losing credibility, which is that this is a this relationship is a a marriage of convenience. It's a nothing burger. It's purely transactional. I think that's hard to um, I think that's hard to support now after seeing developments. Frankly, even if even over just the past few weeks, but especially if you look at the relationship and you start the clock in 1989. Um, this has been a linear upward trajectory of the relationship. Um, hasn't been a, a vertical upward, but this has been a fairly steep um, uh, growth of the relationship over several decades where they have 
um, progressively uh, shelved longstanding disputes like border disputes, which were which were finally solved in the early 2000s. Um, they they've um, um, are seeing a, a increasing breadth of cooperation across technology, uh, uh, military cooperation, um, um, and you're seeing now a real strong personal relationship between Xi Jinping um, and, and Vladimir Putin. And again, and to go back to the, your question, if you read through this very lengthy document, this is a very, um, when we write the chapter about great power competition on China, Russia, uh, 10 years from now, the events of last Friday will, I think, be very critical because they signal that um, Beijing and, and, and uh, Moscow are not operating on the benchmark we use of do they or do they not have a formal military alliance. They're saying, we don't need one. Um, that's not going to slow us down. And frankly, we've got bigger fish to fry. And the fish they want to fry, of course, is the United States. So I think we are uh, not seeing a nothing burger. On the other hand, just quickly, I do think we're not yet at the axis yet because there are deep fissures in the relationship that don't put it in a corner per se, but I think are there lingering in the sidelines that China and Russia are going to have to work out if they're going to really see the relationship improve. And I think a, a, a critical one is this is not an equal partnership. One needs the other uh, more than the other needs them. And that's only going to grow over time. And if, you know, Elliot and I were doing, a, we were in a workshop a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about this. And I think in some of the primary source readings we saw, and I think Elliot commented on this too, you can feel that power differential projected from the Chinese side, and you can feel it received uh, on the Russian side. And so, you know, final point here is after uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, Beijing utilized um, Putin's outstretched hand to renegotiate some very important longstanding deals on Beijing's terms. And you saw some grumbling from the Russians saying, it was a little bit of kicking us in the shins when we were down. Now the relationship grew and improved after that demarcation of 2014, but China's gonna wield that power differential in important ways. So final, final thought, the United States is clearly a binding agent for these two powers right now. I don't think that means we spend our time trying to do a, res a reverse Kissinger. And I don't think that means we take our foot off the pedal, but I think it means we have to be very smart and calculating about when and where we push. We may want to deny them some of the super glue that's pulling them together right now. Um, other times, frankly, maybe the maybe them pushing uh, together may actually help exacerbate some of the fault lines. But um, this is a new era for the China-Russia relationship. And I think our old heuristics probably need to be abandoned and we need to start understanding this relationship on its own terms because I think this is going to be a really dynamic space. Elliot, if you just let me follow up with one more question and then I'll I, you know, kick it back to, to you. There's a certain school of thought that says we need to forget about Russia. It's not important. We have to focus on China. China's the big strategic threat that the United States faces out there in, in the long run. I, I agree with that. And in many of the same circles who articulate uh, that view, there is the view that doesn't matter whether China's authoritarian or democratic or not. Even a democratic China would be a problem for us. Do those two views resonate at all with you or do you have a different take? Take number one, which I think if, if what we're saying is we need to prioritize, yes, uh, of course, uh, uh, we live in a world of scarce resources. I think, though, the ability to cleanly demarcate Russia and China and focus only on the Indo-Pacific is going to be a very difficult task in practice. I think maybe the way to split the difference is we want to prioritize looking at the China relationship insofar as how it affects our strategy of the Indo-Pacific and want to understand where Russia may be a force multiplier for China's own strategy in the region. Because as we saw, by the way, just a few weeks ago, Russia, China, and Iran held joint naval exercises. So we may want to separate the two. We may want to demarcate, but they ain't going to let us. So I, I, I think we need to start understanding the holistic relationship with the two. But I, the sort of Bridge Colby's point of don't let that distract us, I'm 100% on board with. Uh, I, I'm 100% on board. And there must be some part of Xi Jinping which is delighted to see all of the U.S. focus uh, what, you know, uh, in Europe right now. I'm sure he's delighted, delighted at this. On the second part, which is a really critical question, which gets to the point of is China an enduring problem 
or or is it a um, or is this a contingent problem based on China's unique political system? I'm going to say there is something very particular about the way that China foreign policy is run that very much connects with the structure of its political system. Absolutely, there are long-standing historical narratives in China that seek an aspiration of global power, and that would happen under a democratic system. And, and indeed, it, I think it is true. You may see more overt nationalism uh, under a democratic system, but there is something deeply perverting about the Communist Party's specific institutional and ideological orientation that has a very practical effect on the way that it looks at the world, the way it defines hostilities as omnipresent. And of course, very critically for, for this year with the 20th Party Congress, China's political system has no functioning mechanism for the tr peaceful transition of power. And so it, the, the center of gravity for China's political system is of a core autocrat who, who, who leads for life. If you've got a, uh, an enlightened despot, that, that could work out okay for you. Uh, but China's 100-year history, the Communist Party's 100-year history has shown that um, really the puzzle we have to explain is perhaps not Xi Jinping. It's that brief period in the mid-90s and early 2000s where we had a more humble Chinese foreign policy. So, uh, Jude, I want to pick up on that and connect it with the discussion we had about uh, Sino-Russian relations. You know, on that one, it seems to me that we've got one kind of near-term problem but we're also going to be looking at some long-term phenomena. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that session that we had, and I, it was very striking to me as uh, admittedly reading all this stuff in translation that you could, you could sense some of the Russian insecurity and some of the Chinese uh, self-confidence and not quite dismissiveness, but it was quite clear they knew who, uh, who was number one and who was number two. I completely take your analysis about where we are today and in the immediate future, but it seems to me in the longer run, there are going to be two issues which will actually work against China and Russia. One is, uh, which people don't want to talk about too much, but it seems to me is there, and that's just a certain amount of racism, which is particularly deeply embedded, I think, in Russian views of China, strengthened by what had been the relationship between Russia and China during the Cold War. But the other is exactly the succession problem. Both Russia and China are led by men who are getting older. Uh, they're a li little bit older than I am. Um, and, you know, that, that's going to be, that's going to be a challenge for both of them. Neither of them has a succession, uh, really a succession plan. Both of them seem to have leaders who have been coup proofed one way or another. And I have to think that that's going to cause them difficulty because, um, and you've written about this, when these autocracies get into uh, the decline of the old man who has been there for decades and, and can't afford to step down because he can't be sure that he'll survive if he does, they begin to get paralytic and, and so on. So I was first thing I was going to ask was just whether you would agree with that longer term uh, diagnosis. And if you could also just build on it a bit to talk about how how you think that uh, succession problem, which you've discussed uh, quite interestingly, will affect China's behavior in the outside world. I think, I think those are really. I think those are two really good points. Um, on the 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 Putin Xi relationship and the what comes next, to me, seems more of a question mark than it does prescriptive about the about necessarily that hamstringing the relationship. And indeed, I think the, the the outcome, the final outcome of that may well depend on what happens over the next five or 10 years. If Russia and China can build up enough areas of collaboration, coordination, strategic alignment, that may create a powerful sort of sense of momentum, which even, you know, when Xi Jinping eventually does go to see Marx, um, that, that a new leader may come in with the very... So, Sidestep here for a moment. I think the 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 outcome of that will depend on what the security environment for China looks like when Xi Jinping exit, exits power. I think the academic literature tells you when an when a an autocrat leaves power, you usually get someone of the same orientation who takes over for them. So Xi Jinping is not going to put anyone who threatens his power in office. It's going to be a lackey. But I think whatever person ends up 
getting to the throne after Xi Jinping leaves power, the, the odds are they're going to have a very same orientation about the world and the security risks. And then you may end up, you may end up at the same place where Russia at the margin, um, it's better to have uh, a, a strategic alignment with them where you're not having to, um, you're not having to look both to the east and the west. You can focus entirely out at your, your Pacific Rim um, for your security threats. And frankly, it's probably in, in Russia's advantage there to find a way, even in a post-Putin world, to only have to look to the west and not, and not, and not to the east. So I agree. I think, I think you're right in those give me pause about where the maximum elevation that the relationship can find is. But then again, this has been a, a two decade plus trajectory of improved relations over three different, for the Chinese side, three different leadership groups who have come to the same conclusion. Okay, let me ask a uh, curveball question. Uh, uh, it's actually Eric's Chinese science fiction uh, because there has been an explosion of it. To the extent you've been following it, could you, could you talk a little bit about it, particularly for viewers who have not, or listeners rather, who don't pay much attention to science fiction of any kind, uh, much less Chinese science fiction. And, and what kind of insights can you glean from that? Yeah, this has been one of those um, unexpected developments over the past 10 years or so, which is, uh, and especially since there was a, the three body problem is the sort of original uh, piece that book that came out, which is a trilogy, which struck people for its depth, but also the unique perspective because of course it starts in the it, it involves sort of aliens in the future and the cultural revolution there are people who far more um who, who are who are who are experts on this which which i am not um the the i guess the the salient point that strikes me about it is um i think science fiction will continue to be a a, a realm where especially as the system continues to close in china we should expect to see interesting things develop um I think uh, autocrats always hate it when they can't understand what people are saying. And science fiction may well be the one where we begin to see parables uh, that emerge, which challenge the dominant power structure. But I also don't think we should put this as sort of dissident literature. There are also incredibly interesting ideas emerging from Chinese science fiction about the way that we should order the world. Um, and there's a lot for to learn. The, the final comment is one a little bit of sadness because yet again, as a reminder of how much creative energy there is in China, which is being stifled right now as the system continues to close. You know, when you do see Chinese uh, emerge or get these pockets of sovereignty to write and create and think, it's extraordinary. But unfortunately, now we're, we're seeing these as sort of rare cases rather than what should be the case, which is the norm. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's fascinating. I think something somewhat similar was true of science fiction under the Soviet system, that it was quite interesting. And it was one of these spaces where intellectuals could get away with things because the apparatchiks just couldn't really understand what they were saying. And so they, they, uh, they shrugged it off. Or you could say, Elliot, that it was set in, you know, a faraway, you know, galaxy, you know, thousands of years in the future. So it obviously had no relevance to today, even though it was very clearly an Aesopian reference to what was going on yeah. today. Uh, which was the case with a lot of, of Soviet science fiction. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, this has been uh, terrific, Jude. I, uh, I'm sure all of our listeners will understand why I'm so delighted to have you as a colleague at uh, CSIS. And uh, we have a lot more to talk about, so we'll bring you back on at some point. Eric? Yeah, thank you, Jude. This has been you know, really terrific. I would like to get you back on, not least because we didn't get the semiconductors, and that is a very, very big issue, um, as you know, from your business background for the future, not just of U.S. military power, but uh, so much of what goes on in the commercial economy and the uh, China-Taiwan confrontation, you know, obviously is a, is a big threat. So we'll have to have you come back and talk about that in the future. But for the moment, thank you so much for coming on Shield of the Republic. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a real, real pleasure and honor. This is Eric Edelman. Shield of the Republic is a product of The Bulwark. And if you're enjoying the podcast, as we hope you are, please consider subscribing to The Bulwark and The Bulwark Plus, which will give you access to all the Bulwark content, including the morning shots and triad newsletters, as well as other podcasts that are behind the paywall. And please make sure to leave a review for us at Shield of the Republic and a comment on the podcast platform wherever you get your podcasts.